Good morning, Spring Lake Church. How are y'all doing this morning? Good. It's good to see you. If we haven't met yet, my name is Ryan, and I'm one of the pastors on staff at Spring Lake. I'm the pastor of Family Ministries, which uh, means that I work closely with uh, teenagers, mostly at our Bellevue campus, uh, but I work with Garrett, who's our student ministry guy down here, and I also get to supervise the the kids' ministry team, so it's a delight to be with you here this morning. Um, As you could tell from the slide that's there, uh, we're continuing in a sermon series called Family Tree. Our church likes to string sermons together uh, with a common theme, and so our theme for the last couple of weeks has been uh, the family, and we're going to continue that for a couple more weeks, and today we're looking at a topic, an issue that certainly faces all of our families, but really it faces um, any one of us, uh, regardless of what part you have in a family, whether you're a son or a daughter or an uncle or an aunt, a brother, sister, mom, or dad, you, uh, you are a part of a family, and all of us are trying to grapple with this question of technology and its place in our lives. That's what we're going to be looking at today, and I, I don't know how many of you resonated with that video Uh, whether that feels like it describes your day, your life. I know for me, as I was preparing for this message, I was thinking about how saturated my life is uh, with technology. So I wake up in the morning and all of a sudden the alarm goes off, 5.30, my phone. uh, Contrary to all advice that I got in preparing for this message, my phone, my smartphone is next to my bed as my alarm clock, okay? It goes off, I get up after hitting snooze a couple times and I'm trying to like keep the winter weight off uh, by going to the treadmill. So I go downstairs and I throw my, uh, my headphones and put a show on my treadmill and I walk for a little bit, either a show or, or a podcast, and finish that, and I come back upstairs, still got the headphones in, I grab a cup of coffee from my automatic coffee maker, set to go off and you know prep the coffee while I'm working out. I sit down with my Bible, usually my physical Bible, okay, and uh, I'm reading scripture, but I've also got my phone nearby because I've got all this like cool Bible software on my phone. I can look at the original languages, look at commentaries, that sort of thing, and so sure, every once in a while, like notifications go off, and you know, there's a text message that comes through, or whatever, there's a reminder I need to look at, but anyways, I'm reading the Bible, and then at some point, eating breakfast, and maybe I listen to another podcast, at some point, I I do a a Duolingo uh, lesson on my my phone, I'm learning Spanish, I'm checking up on, or continuing on my Spanish, and so I do do a, a, a lesson really quick, and then I head out the door, listen to a podcast in the car, are you seeing a theme? I get to, uh, to work and spend the whole day on my computer. I'm checking emails, I'm messaging people, we're in meetings, and even when we're in meetings, we're all on our devices sometimes, don't tell Jack, sometimes we're you know, watching videos while we're in meetings, or we're messaging each other while we're in meetings, okay, so you've never been there, I'm sure. Get home, uh, or I pick up a late there from school, get home, and there's a little bit of downtime with the kids. We got littles, so they do a little bit of screen time. Jenny and I catch up a little bit. There's dinner, then hang out with the kids, and all through that time, I feel like the ring of power calling to me from inside my pocket, you know? It's like notifications go off, whatever it is, and I just feel this draw, like I want to just pull it out and look at it and show the kids the top of my head, and and it just calls to me. The kids go to bed, and it's, it's me and Jenny time. It's time for us to connect, and... Man, it's so easy for us to sit down across from each other, uh, her on one couch, me on another, and just open up our phones and scroll through whatever has been waiting for us to get through throughout the rest of the day, check emails, check Facebook, read that news story, whatever it is to entertain ourselves. Sometimes we use technology together, but sometimes uh, we use it to just entertain ourselves. I don't know, does that sound like anybody else's day? Like, do I just have a serious problem? (laughs) My life is saturated, saturated with technology. And all of us are trying to figure out what's the proper place of technology in our lives. Some of us had to do online schooling for the first time this last couple years, and we try to wrestle with what does that look like. Some of us have kids, and we're trying to grapple with what are What's the role of screens in our kids' lives, and what do limits look like, and what does screen time look like in a world where everything is online, where all their schoolwork is online, and all the way they communicate with their friends is online. All of us are trying to figure out balance in our own lives. What does that look like? Some of us are just exhausted, if we're just being honest, at trying to keep up with the rapid pace and the development of technology. Not another app, not another username and password, not another device in our homes. Some of us got used to doing church online during the pandemic, and 
that, we, that became a pattern in our lives and we're trying to figure out or we have friends who that's the only way they still engage with church and we're all trying to figure out what's the new normal? Like what is, what is does that count? Should I feel good about that or is that just normal? And we're, we're trying to figure out all of that. What's the place that technology uh, should have in our lives? And so this morning as, as we kind of dive in and, and talk about this, I don't wanna just give you my opinion to be honest with you. Like you don't need Pastor Ryan's five tips to have a successful relationship with technology. I want to look at what does scripture say, and I want to give us a, a biblical, theological lens to think Christianly about technology, because if we don't do that, we'll have one of two default reactions. You will either uncritically reject technology, whatever the newest technology is. Maybe that's some of us who are older in the room. There's new technology or new apps or whatever it is, and we kind of are like, Ugh, I don't like that, and you uncritically reject it. Or our default would be to uncritically embrace whatever the latest technology is. Yes, give me more, plug me into more, I can do more things. And that could be our, our default as well. But instead, I think God wants us to think carefully, think critically, think Christianly about the technology in our lives. So what I want to do is I want to give you a biblical theology of technology. Ooh, okay, we're going to look at what is, how does the Bible unpack this development of technology within Scripture, and then I want to give us two biblical lenses through which to view whatever piece of technology you're looking at, whatever um, area of technology in your lives you're looking at, okay? So that's what we're going to do. If you have a Bible, you can grab your Bibles and turn on your Bibles eh, or turn in your Bibles. Uh, we're just going to start in Genesis, and we're going to work all the way through um, the Bible, through to Revelation, looking at the way we see technology uh, develop in Scripture. We start at the beginning, Genesis chapter 1. For those who are unfamiliar with the Bible, the first two chapters of your Bible are in a book called Genesis, and they depict God's original design for human beings before we screwed everything up, <laughs> before we sinned, before we rebelled. And so we see God in the beginning give human beings a job. Look at verse 28 of the first chapter of the Bible. Genesis chapter 28, God had just created humans, said that they're his image bearers. And then we see that God blessed them and said to them, the humans, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. So we see the command, be fruitful and multiply, have lots of babies, but also fill the earth. Fill the earth with what? With, with the things that humans create, with culture, with art, with beauty. Many, many Bible scholars throughout history have thought, even if human beings had not rebelled against God, which we're coming to, that humans would still have this job to do, to create, to invent, to design, to fill the earth, and to subdue it, to bring God's creation under his reign and rule, to, uh, to subdue the chaotic nature of, uh, of the environment, and so fill the earth and subdue it. Scroll down a little bit to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, we see, kind of zoomed in uh, to the Garden of Eden, we see God give the man uh, a job to do there as well, very similar. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So if you grew up thinking that work was a bad thing, uh, created by the fall or sin, sorry, human beings are designed to work. It's part of our job uh, to care for, to cultivate, to keep the creation that God has given us. And so that's the trajectory. That's the assignment for God's people. And then human beings screwed up. They rebel against God. Genesis chapter 3, they say, we don't want to listen to you. We want to do things our own way. And so they sin, and they release death and chaos and destruction onto the world. So after Genesis 3, we see an intertwining of these two themes throughout Scripture. We see on the one hand, human beings developing technology. They don't just stay naked and unashamed in the garden. They develop technology. And that's a good thing because we're supposed to think, oh, well, they're doing the thing that God told them to do. They're filling the earth and subduing it. And they're developing and they're creating. That's good. But we also see human beings take their technology and misuse it and abuse it and uh, use it in negative and sinful, ungodly ways. So just a quick survey, Genesis chapter 4. You have never read these verses carefully, I guarantee you. But in Genesis chapter 4, verses 17 to 22, we see the development of tent making. These descendants of Cain learn how to develop tents, and they learn how to do farming, like agriculture. So they're not just wandering nomad herdsmen. They're doing agriculture. They develop musical instruments, how to make musical instruments, and... 
they developed the technology of metallurgy, of forging metal. And we go, wow, that's pretty cool. Now they can make tools and hammers and chisels and shovels, but the same technology that allows human beings to make farming tools allows them to make what? Weapons. Ah, yes. And so we get the first murders. We get people developing knives and swords and axes and long-range missiles and poison gas. And people figure out more and more creative ways to kill each other, don't we? The same technology that we could create musical instruments to play, praise the creator God, people use to worship other gods, to make their own gods. And so we see this intertwining as the storyline of the Bible goes on. We get to Genesis 11, and people invent bricks. Like, they make brick technology. It's pretty cool. And we think, oh, that's kind of nice. And they build this tower, and we think, that's cool. But then what's the tower for? Oh, actually, it's not to obey God. It's to make a name for themselves <laughs> so they don't have to spread throughout the earth. They can cluster together in one city and make a name for themselves, become famous in their own eyes. And there's kind of an interesting hyperlink there. The only other place in the Hebrew Bible where that word for bricks shows up is in Exodus chapter one when Pharaoh tells the Israelites to make a bricks for him as his slaves. So we're supposed to put those things next to each other and go, oh man, human beings, they can make this technology as bricks and yet they warp it and they twist it and they use it for injustice and for evil. We keep going in the storyline of the Bible. The uh, Israelites are rescued by God from slavery in Egypt. He brings them out into the desert. And in Exodus 35, he tells them how to design this tent. Remember, they learned how to make tents. Uh, now they're going to make a tent that God's going to dwell in. And it's actually designed like a garden. It's a mobile Eden that God's going to travel with them in this tabernacle, this tent. And it says God fills these people who are designing the tent, fills them with skill and with wisdom. And they're using this technology. It says that there's a, they're a craftsman. It's like, oh, that's kind of cool. But then if you follow that thread and you track it down in the Bible, we see that the same skill uh, that makes someone a craftsman to create the tabernacle, people use that to make... Carbon images overlaid with gold that they bow down to to make idols and to worship idols. We follow it on and we get to the New Testament and we see that Jesus himself has come. He's God in the flesh. He's the presence of God come to dwell among his people, tabernacling among his people. And we learn in Mark 6 that Jesus is a tectone. He is a carpenter. Jesus is a builder. That's part of what he does. He's uh, the perfect human, right? So he's a builder. That's pretty cool. He's like the new Adam, right? But then Jesus comes to the end of his life, and he's killed. He's crucified on a piece of human invention, isn't he? A cross. Humans invented ways to kill each other, and Jesus, the carpenter, is killed on a cross, probably constructed by a tectone, probably a builder or a carpenter. Follow the thread, and we get to the Last chapters of the Bible, the book of Revelation, where in Revelation we see a picture of two cities. There's the city of Babylon, verse chapter 17 through 18, this embodiment, this symbolic depiction of the human empires of this world that become beastly and they use technology to subdue humans and promote injustice. And then there's another city. The final chapters of the Bible, chapters 21 and 22 of Revelation, depict the new Jerusalem which is a symbolic depiction of the new creation that Jesus is gonna bring about when he returns. And I just wanna show you um, the way that John depicts these, this reality in Revelation 21 and 22. Look with me at 21, verse 22 and following. John writes, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any 
curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. That's what human beings were designed to do in the beginning, to reign and rule over God's good creation. And so we see the depiction of the new creation is not simply us going back to the garden naked and unashamed, hallelujah, right? (laughs) But we actually go forward. We go forward and God integrates the things that human beings have created, the technology that human beings have created. And the final depiction is not of a garden, but of a garden city. And we see an intertwining of God's good creation and human beings' creation. And there's a puzzle. There's a mystery there. Did you notice that the kings of the nation will bring their splendor and their glory into the new Jerusalem? Man, I just want to go for a walk and be like, what does that even mean? You know? I know it's imagery, but it's, it's tantalizing. It's like maybe the best of human culture, maybe the best of human invention will be purified of sin and brought into the new creation. Just thinking out loud, maybe, right? So here's technology depicted in the Bible. We see these themes intertwining. Technology is a good gift from God. We pervert it, we twist it, we misuse it, and yet God wants to redeem it. God wants to make all things new. It can enhance our embodied image bearing or it can be detracting from it. It can be a blessing or a curse. There's your biblical theology of technology. Everybody take a deep breath. We did it, okay. So let's get practical, because it's like, all right, Ryan, that's neat, little Bible tricks. But like, what about, you know, my life, you know? And we're not debating, we're not discussing whether or not to, for instance, use shovels as opposed to digging in the dirt with our hands. We're not trying to figure out whether or not we should let our kids have a car when they get older or uh, ride a horse and buggy. We're not even thinking, should we, you know, how old should my kids be when I buy them a record player, you know? or an eight track, no, 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 we're talking about digital technology, we're talking about the total integration into our lives, the ubiquitous presence of Wi-Fi, digital information at our fingertips 24 seven, all the time. How, how do we relate to that kind of technology in our lives? And so I do think drawn from these themes in scripture, we see these two lenses through which we need to view technology, whatever piece of technology you have in front of you, whatever piece of technology or type of technology gets invented. The first, techno- or the first lens through which we need to view technology is that technology, according to the Bible, can be a gift that we enjoy and use wisely. Technology can be a gift that we enjoy and use wisely. Bible nerds uh, have called this, um, this type of gift common grace, common grace. Special grace is like the gift that God gives us in salvation, forgiveness, justification, all that, but common grace are the gifts that God gives to all human beings everywhere, regardless of whether or not they believe in him. And we would say that technology is a common grace. It's a gift that God gives, and we need to thank God for the gifts that he gives us. They are good, and it's part of our calling as human beings to develop technology, to invent things. We might have some future inventors here in the room. We might all be using the technology that you invent uh, years down the road. And there's no doubt in my mind, there's no doubt in any of our minds that technology comes with huge benefits. We're all benefiting from technology right now. I mean, we're looking on screens, I'm speaking through a microphone, we spent time worshiping with electronic instruments. We benefit from technology. So how do we know when technology is functioning as it should. How do we know? What are the signs that it's being used wisely? Well, I would say that when technology assists in our role as image bearers, that is when it assists us in work, in worship, or in rest, that's a wise use of technology, when it assists us in our role as image bearers, work, worship, rest, or when it assists in forming us into the image of God the image of Christ, when it assists in making us more and more like Jesus. That's a wise use of technology, of God's good gift. So that might mean learning more, like learning more about God, yes, but it could also mean cultivating virtue or character or uh, when technology aids us in resisting sin. Those would be good, wise uses of 
technology. So if your default reaction is to resist technology, like there's some new sort of tech that comes out and you're like, yuck, I don't like this, this is new and scary, let me just poke and prod a little bit, view technology through this first lens, can be a good gift to enjoy and use wisely. Just a couple questions to ask. First question to ask is, is there something here that I can thank God for? Is there something here that I can thank God for? And by the way, we, we need to thank God for it because if we don't, then we'll just give humans the credit for technology, right? Then humans will say, ah, oh, look at us. Look at the things that we can build and create. No, no, it's a gift. You know, it's a gift from God. So is there something you can thank God for? Many of us have downloaded Zoom for the first time in the last couple of years. We've stayed in touch with people across the world. We have been able to be, stay in touch with our kids. That's a benefit. We can thank God. Thank God for Zoom. That's amazing. How about uh, Walmart pickup? Anybody? Yes, or Aldi pickup. Moms are like, hallelujah, praise God for his gifts of technology. That's so good. We don't have to run into the store trying to lasso all your kids and, you know, like wrestle them to the ground or like my parents did just leave us in the car. I just think about that. They just left us in the car. Anyway, uh, and then just <laughs> run into the store. The hours that I spent in the car as a kid. Mom's not watching this. That's okay. So we can thank God. We can thank God for that. I am so thankful for the uh, biblical tools available to me on my phone to be able to look up commentaries and languages and that sort of thing. That's a good gift from God. Truly, those things are available to you. I like to say that you can get most of the things that I paid thousands of dollars for in seminary, you can get them for free. I'm not bitter about that at all, okay? <laughs> Just <laughs> go take advantage of those good gifts from God. So is there something you can thank God for? Another question would be, if you're looking at a piece of technology, is, is there a way this technology can help me develop as a human being, as an image bearer of God? And I'm getting this from a book by Andy Crouch. It's called The Tech Wise Family. Very small, it's very nice. Uh, and he distinguishes between kinds of technology that, are, um, that aid us in cultivating skill or character and kinds of technology that just promise us ease. Okay? So there's a way of using technology to help us cultivate skill and character, and there's a way of using technology that just gives us ease. For example, if you've ever used technology to learn a language, uh, learn how to paint, learn a musical instrument, that would be uh, cultivating a skill, uh, uh, developing as an image bearer of God. That's great. Uh, if you, like my dad, have ever learned how to fix something in your house, uh, my dad was going to come over and help me with some plumbing, and I'm like, Dad, like, I didn't know you knew anything about plumbing. And he goes, Ryan, there's this thing called YouTube <laughs> where you can just type in what you want to fix and the videos will come up and they'll show you. They'll even tell you what tools you need. I'm like, Dad, yeah, I know about YouTube, you know? That's great. But what's he doing? He's using that to develop a skill, right? And that would be a wise and good use of technology. Another question to ask if your default is to react against technology ugh, is... Are you reacting against the use of the technology or are you reacting against just the newness of it? Are, are you reacting against the way it's being used or purely just the newness of it? I see this with older folks or with parents that they walk into a room and they see a bunch of teenagers doing this and immediately they're, they feel filled with despair. Oh, their brains are melting. Like, like this is, you know, like this is God's judgment upon this current generation. It's gonna ruin them. And I just think, well, oh, hold on, hold on. Well, what are they using their phones for? Like if you had walked into your living room and everybody had their nose in a book, uh, you wouldn't feel despair. But if they're reading a book on their Kindle or on their iPad, or if they're doing their homework on their laptop, like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't feel that way if it was physical. Why? Are you just reacting against the newness of it or the digitalness of it? Or is it actually the way that they're using it that is unwise? We need to separate those two things out and ask, is there uh, a way that this technology is being used that I, well, I would be okay with? I just don't like the fact that it's on a screen. So for instance, like, you may have grown up thinking that like, what families do is they play board games together. Hmm. We're all gonna play board games together. And then actually you learn, no, actually it's okay to like sit down and play video games with my kids and use that to connect with them, right? Uh, to sit and play a game together and do that digitally. Uh, I know that I spent tons of time uh, watching Saturday morning cartoons 
uh, on, on the TV when I was a little kid, and yet that feels fine to me for some reason to have my kids watching the TV, but it feels icky to me if they're doing it on their phone, right? And I need to think through, why, why does it feel so much worse, right? Uh, and we need to separate the uses from the uh, actual, uh, maybe the newness of it. And then finally, a question to ask if your default is to be resistant towards technology is this. How can this technology be redeemed for the glory of God and the spread of his kingdom? Can this technology be redeemed for the glory of God and the spread of his kingdom. Now, as I was preparing for this, I was thinking to myself, there has to be a piece of social media or technology that's totally unredeemable, right? Like some sort of form that's like, you know, it's, it's purely invented by Satan. And I thought, TikTok. You know, like TikTok. TikTok is a, it's a social media video. They're short videos that kind of go rapid fire. They just expanded the length of the videos. But anyway, I thought, you know, TikTok, that's just purely from the pit of hell. But I went, but I went and kind of started looking through TikTok. And you know what I found? I found a treasure trove. I had to look kind of hard, and there was a lot of rabbit holes to avoid, but I found a treasure trove of Christian uh, videos defending the truthfulness of the Bible, explaining uh, the truths of Scripture, explaining the Christian faith, and defending the Christian faith. And I was like, okay, God, I guess you can really redeem anything, you know? If God can redeem you, broken sinner, he can redeem TikTok, amen? Amen. He can, and so can we look for ways that God can redeem uh, the technology that is in front of us and use it for the spread of his kingdom? That's the first lens that technology can be a gift we enjoy and use wisely. But lest we uncritically adopt all forms and uses of technology, there is a, a second lens to consider, which is this. Lens number two is that technology can be an idol we worship and misuse. Technology can be an idol that we worship and misuse. If you're relatively unfamiliar with the Bible or Christianity, you might not recognize that word idol. Let me just uh, unpack what I mean by that. I actually had to look this up in a book myself for a definition. It's this book. It's Pastor Ryan's book of short, helpful definitions (laughs) that probably need more clarifying, but will do the trick for now. Uh, I looked under the eyes for idol, and here's what I found. If you want a copy of this, just go ahead and come find me afterwards. Uh, an idol is this. Uh, one, anything that is more important to you than God. Or, number two, anything you go to for what only God can give you. Anything that's more important to you than God or anything you go to for what only God can give you. Do we treat technology like an idol? Absolutely, we do. We go to technology for comfort. We go to it for pleasure. We go to it for peace, for security. Don't raise your hand, but how many of us have a ring doorbell? We trust in our technology to protect us. We go to it for all sorts of things that we ought to be going to God for. We can turn it easily into an idol. And so how do we know what are the signs that our technology is being worshipped or being misused? I would say when our technology begins to master us, when we begin to serve our technology instead of using it, or when it begins to malform our character, instead of transforming us and making us more like Jesus, when our use of technology makes us less like Jesus, that's a sign that it's an idol we're worshiping or misusing. So a couple questions to reflect on. It might make us a little bit uncomfortable this morning, but a couple questions to reflect on. If, you, if your default is to uncritically embrace technology, ask this. In what ways is my use of this technology forming me? In what ways is my use of this technology forming me? A guy by the name of Tony Ranke wrote a book in 2017 called 12 Ways Your Phone Is Changing You. And he goes into detail in terms of our brain chemistry and um, a bunch of sociological studies of the ways that having smartphones uh, has changed human beings, is changing human beings. Uh, I'll list just a few that he writes down. He says, uh, we become addicted to distraction. I'd love to know how many of you have looked at your phone since I started talking. Uh, We ignore flesh and blood, or we ignore God's creation for our screens, because what's on our screens is actually more interesting than the people in front of us. How many of us have ignored our children because our screens are more exciting or interesting? He says we crave immediate approval, a feedback loop from social media. He says we get lonely. We have a fear of missing out. Correlation between use of social media and anxiety and depression is pretty stark, in, especially in teenagers. We fear missing out. He says we become harsher with one another. 
when we're not interacting and we can see the other person's face, but when we're merely sniping at people from behind a keyboard, we are harsher with one another. All ways that our phones are changing us. So ask, how is my use of this technology forming me, making me more like Jesus or less like Jesus? Another question, am I using technology to do something or as an excuse to do nothing? Or am I being used by this technology by somebody else? So am I using it to do something? Am I uh, using it as an excuse or am I being used? Uh, Many of us have wasted hours of our lives on a Netflix binge, on a YouTube binge, the next video just coming, just wait another five seconds, here it comes, and we sit there and our lives waste away. Friends, that is not an accident. There are people whose job it is to figure out how to keep you looking at your screen for as long as possible. Why? It's all about the money. Someone said this to me a number of years ago. It stuck with me. If you are not paying for something, then someone is paying for you to watch what you're watching or to engage with what you're engaging, okay? So that doesn't mean that we need to become Amish, throw away our phones. Maybe we need to be a little more Amish than we are, but, uh, but we need to think critically about how are we using technology or are we being used by technology? Another question to ask is, what are the unintended consequences of using the technology the way I do or as frequent as I do? Unintended consequences. Because the the thing you're actually doing in the technology might be really good, but it might have unintended consequences. Example, many of us during the last couple years, we have streamed a church service at some point. We, We went to church online. And that was a blessing because it allowed us to stay apart but remain connected to one another. We've been able to stay connected to church when we're out of town. It's like, that's a good gift, amen? That's a good gift from God. Yeah, we love it. And yet, what might be an unintended consequence of streaming church online? You could, you could end up slowly but surely thinking of church as content that you consume rather than a family that you belong to. What are the unintended consequences of having cameras in the room as a pastor recording themselves and looking at a screen. There's some unintended consequences there. And we need to be careful. What are the unintended consequences of using technology the way that we are? A couple more questions. Are there any sacred times or spaces in your week or in your home where it is digital technology free? Are there any sacred times or spaces in your home or in your week, in your calendar, that is technology, digital technology, free. Uh, Again, from Andy Crouch in the book TechWise Family, he says that people, if they want to start, should think about, could we, for one hour a day, maybe one day a week, and then he says, one week a year, turn off our digital devices and be with each other. Just try this. Try for one hour a day. Maybe it's the hour during dinner time. Maybe it's the hour before your kids go to bed. Just shut off your phone and set it on the counter, and it'll be there for you when you get back. Don't worry, right? Your emails will be there. But what if we did that for one hour a day? Could we maybe feel the grip that technology has on our hearts release slowly? You know, there's something to this idea of rest and Sabbath that God gave his people. Maybe we need to have a rhythm of taking a break, whether it's one hour a day, one day a week. And if you are someone who lives, uh, you're, you're single, you're not, uh, you don't have kids, um, and you're kind of the decision maker of how you engage with technology, this can be even harder for us because we don't have someone telling us what the rules are. Um, but every one that I've read, I have read has said that even families together, especially if you have teenagers in your home, need to make have this be a communal uh, discussion of how do we as a family use technology. Many families have found it helpful to create some sort of media covenant to say, in our home, this is where uh, you're not allowed to have your technology in the bathroom or in the bedroom. Uh, This is where everybody's phone goes. Create rules and rhythms. And so I want to recommend a book called Right Click, uh, Parenting Your Teenager in a Digital Media World. It's really good even if you don't have teenagers. Someone emailed me and told me that they just reprinted it under a different name. It's called Every Parent's Guide to Navigating Our Digital World. But if you, uh, if you look for Right Click, you can find it um, as well uh, if you want to create a media covenant um, for your family. And then finally, last question to ask is this. Are there, digital, or, sorry, are there non-digital ways of doing whatever it is that you're doing? So... Uh, In the movie Jurassic Park, uh, there's this line, they say, you know, the scientists spent so much time trying to figure out if they could do it, 
that they never stopped and asked whether they should. <laughs> and so I think that's the way we are with our technology. Oh, man, I can read my Bible on my phone. Oh, man, I can, I can stream church. Oh, man, I can do this. Oh, I can do this digitally. We could FaceTime instead of getting together. The question is, okay, could we do this activity non-digitally and from time to time to make a conscious choice to say, you know what? We're going to choose to do this in person. We're going to choose to do this in an embodied way that we can touch and we can feel. And every once in a while, I think that helps us stay grounded to uh, our embodiedness as human beings. Technology is a tool to be used. It's not a master to be served. And it can help us in our formation into the image of God, but we need to take heed in how it forms us. It can be an idol we worship and misuse. So let me ask you, how's your relationship with technology? It's the question to kind of reflect on maybe over lunch. How is your relationship to technology in your home? And be processing and talking about that. Now, it's possible that you could just become exhausted by even thinking about this. Ryan, uh, I don't want to think about this. Like, and maybe you're the kind of person that uh, you just get worn out by even thinking about, man, how, how do we think about technology in our lives? And what's coming down the pipe? I mean, artificial intelligence and self-driving cars and, ah, and you could get stressed out about all that kind of stuff. And let me, just, let me just leave you with a word of hope, okay? God has never been surprised by our development of technology. Amen? Never. He's never looked at human beings and said, oh, no, they figured out how to do the wheel. Oh, no, not, not electricity, don't. No, it's gonna ruin everything. He's never looked at us and said, no, now you have Facebook. Oh, it's gonna suck your souls away. No, no, God, God sees the future. He knows the future, and he will give us what we need. He has given us what we need in his word. He's given us his spirit to think critically, to think wisely about our use of technology. And I believe that he will provide the motivation that we need. Uh, and when we sin, and when we sin against him with our technology, he will provide us the forgiveness that we need. He has done so through his son Jesus, through his death on the cross for us. And so let's commit to serving him and not worshiping the good gifts that he's given us together. Let's pray. Father, we confess that sometimes we fall in love with your gifts and we begin to worship them instead of worshiping you. Lord, I confess that I have ignored people that you have put in my life because what was on my screen was more exciting to me in the moment. I confess that I have trusted in my technology instead of trusting in you. I thank you for your son Jesus, for his death on the cross and his resurrection for the forgiveness that you provide, for the guidance and the gift of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you fill us as a church community to be people who use technology wisely to spread the good news about Jesus, all the while not falling prey to making it an idol. We need you. We love you. As we sing now to you as one voice, I pray that you show us and you remind us that you alone are worthy of our worship. You are beautiful. You are good. You are worthy of our praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Would you stand with us as we worship in song?